This is mostly ancient history. All right. I'm asking you How ancient? <laughs> Sumerian? Uh, not that ancient. We're going back to your ancient history. Oh. Uh, and we're going to also focus around, around the Jayla. And there's only 10 questions here. It looks like one was added. But, um, I'm just going to let you talk. Whatever you want to talk about freely. I'm just going to ask you the first question. Yeah, I just prefer it be more of a conversation rather than a. Sure. Yeah. Um, the other, the other, the other um, makes me feel as though I'm testifying, and uh, I'm prepared to do that as well. Okay, uh, under the right hand and put your left hand on the Bible here. <laughs> yeah, no, or was it your right hand? That's supposed to be and as long as we're in a closed session, <laughs> so help me God. Yeah, conversation is definitely the way to go. Yeah, I'm working on that subpoena. I talked to a big time attorney, and we're talking different things. At a, at a different time. So. Yeah, he's a great guy too. He's a good guy. He's experienced. High level. As 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 I was as I was saying to to Bill on the way over here, I was ordered to present a copy of my order to meet him uh, at St. Mark's Square. Um, that order contains a, an initial of a committee member, a coded initial of a committee member. Uh, from what I understand, there's currently a 1716 split. Uh, and this is this is mostly rumor around the community to to um, um, forward a public acclamation program having to do with the majestic 12 and the over overseeing committee the old 5412 um, which is now basically called the committee of the majority as far as I'm I'm told um, the questions are just to give us a little structure well oh, that's fine okay. that's that's fine well that's interesting news if I say something or one of them says something, just just answer, you know, talk to me. That's fine. Keep going between you and Bill. The lights are the lights are cumbersome, but that's a much? Okay. that's fine. Right. That's yeah, fine. Right. That's fine. Um, if you look closely, they're nice and red from looking through the scope all last night, so they can't get much worse. Well, several locations in the mid-90s. I had uh, some cover positions here in Las Vegas, which made me look like a good old-fashioned Joe. And in fact, I had had some police experience uh, at the late 80s. Um, you're probably centering your question around the work for the government. Um, in 1986, I was approached while working as an undergraduate student in Dr. Bert Bell Barbero's office um, in his in his parasitology laboratory, to be exact, um, I was looking through a scope at the time. Uh, three gentlemen walked into the laboratory, closed the door behind them. Uh, there was um, two uniforms and a suit that were present. Both of the uniforms I would make as as most probably being uh, United States Navy. Um, my memory of that one event's kind of hazy after seeing all of the suits and uniforms and whatnot. Um, we spoke for a while, they asked me if I was interested in seeing the world and the like. I told them I, in fact, was. Uh, we went through several several um, um, interview processes, not unlike this, uh, and uh, reviewed my background. I went through several background investigations. Um, finally, starting up uh, 9091 time frame, I was, I was cleared for working um, groom, well, pass room to the Papoose uh, Mountain Facility, um, that place that doesn't exist, about 90 miles yeah. north of here, um, the nowhere place. Um, that's how I came to work there. Uh, my original assignment, my original assignment was at the Groom Lake facility to review uh, histopathology slides. Um, and I went through nearly a year's testing and then was um, basically let loose for a year and I heard no contact from them. After that I was brought back in and shown some higher grade slides of unknown origin. Uh, following that I was int introduced into a working group and subsequently brought into the Papoose facility, the Site 4 facility. Um, 
we, we worked for well over a year on slides of unknown origin. Um, after I took a minimum leadership position under several of the other um, biologists who are already present, um, most of which are, are now deceased, um, you know the names of those individuals. Um, I was then introduced into the, the level four or five facility, and the four or five coded for nine, you're again aware, you know, we yeah. covered this in ancient history. Um, and so what we did is, is uh, introduce, introduce uh, the new members, myself amongst them, into the, into the, uh, the clean sphere area, and we were eventually shown the subject uh, for which we were examining the slides. The slides were unusual in that they were in pressurized cells, um, and they were they were reviewed by us on a conveyor with a with a completely automatic microscope. We weren't touching anything. We'd give verbal commands. Um, at the second instance, uh, we were finally allowed to have a, a VRML like keyboard uh, for examining the slides. And I digressed, but then working with the uh, the J Rod itself in the ambassadorial suite or the Clean Sphere suite. Um, now, was this under this Project Aquarius? Yes, yes. Um, initially, I was assigned as a as a working member of Project Aquarius. Uh, then, finally, I was made a, a uh, an assistant working group leader. Um, and then, mysteriously, after one meeting with the J Rod, I was asked to take the uh, the working group leader position. I didn't find out why I was asked to take the working group leader position until well within this last year. I, I never understood it because uh, Stephen was was older than I. He was my senior not only in in ability, uh, but in age. And I, I would have never figured being advanced uh, above an individual like that in in ranking within a working group. And in fact, I never considered myself above him. I we worked together. Um, the Q Q94 document that um, you have in your possession was co-authored. My name went on there as the, the primary investigator because I was the working group leader. But in fact, he and I were both involved in the authoring of that document. Oh. Okay. Now, could you explain briefly uh, what you were briefed on, on who and or what J-Rod was? Initially, I was briefed that J-Rod was an alien, uh, specifically from the reticulum system to reticulum 4. Uh, I had no idea the truth, yes, from 2 Reticulum 4 now, but I had no idea the truth of how they came to be. Um, as I said to you before, I have never met an alien, but I have met an extraterrestrial. Um, I found out subsequent to, to uh, interactions with the J-Rod and again, they have, they have personal names. The term J-Rod simply means 15, which was a, a basing name for where they're located, the number of light years from, from our location. So they took those names. Uh, and they identified through the Sigma protocols, the linguistic protocols, with a rod symbol, which was a, uh, an inertia symbol, and the letter J. And in fact, that was a combination of Mayan and Egyptian numerology having to do with a rod and a J, meaning 10 and 5 for 15. <laughs> okay. Um, now, 15 light years away, is that the police 876? 876 Charlie, from what I've been told. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he, he did not specifically tell me that that was the location, but the number 15 was mentioned. Well, they don't call it, apparently, police 876, whatever, Charlie. How did J. Rod get here? I mean, how did he, you know, 15 light years away? That's... He crashed in 63, from what I understand. Oh, is that right? Outside of uh, Kingman. Okay. Kingman, Arizona. Right. Uh, there, there was a problem involving his physiology and his biophysiological um, communication with the craft mm -hmm. went wrong. And, of course, he's, he's ill, as we know, with the, the MGUS and the paraprotein-associated problems. Um, and he crashed. And how was he... Was he transported immediately from that crash site to the S-4 facility? And how is that I don't know. Okay. That I don't know. You don't know how he was, he came to be at the facility? I, be, I, I, believe, I believe he and uh, associates were transferred separately. 
um, he to the he to the uh, originally to the Groom Lake facility, uh, and an associate to I believe Los Alamos. Um, I have no independent verification of where the associate went, though. All I can say is that he was there at Site 4. I... Now, you interacted with J. Rod. Was there a general procedure for this interaction? Well, there was not a general procedure. There was a very specific procedure. Very specific, okay. Um, after we would be brought in with our helper biologists, there was controlling helper biologists, those in the, in the gallery, and then the, the, the introduction specialist, which was myself on a number of occasions. Um, we entered the clean sphere through a large series of protocols involving uh, um, pressurization uh, and compartmentalization, no pun intended, um, until finally we were pressurized in, in fully encapsulated a TEC, a TES, uh, total encapsulated suit for entrance into the clean sphere. Um, once we were pressurized and entered into the clean sphere, um, well, I should digress. We had a medical, medical evaluation, all of that first, but um, they they ceased doing that after a couple of medical evaluations. It was more just interested. Let's get you in and get the work done. Um, I would enter into the into the clean sphere, and I was not supposed to um, communicate with the J Rod at all. Uh, I was not supposed to know his name. Um, the reality is we were communicating from the time that I entered into the, the uh, ambassadorial suite external to the clean sphere, um, talking back and forth freely. Uh, I could hear whatever he was projecting at me from thought, and he could very clearly hear what I was thinking. Uh, I say hear, meaning perceive. Um, I was supposed to stand over by a hologram projection system, which was run as like a teleprompter system, over to my right that would be run inside of the clean sphere glass, um, hold my hand up and, and mimic certain signs. And it became a joke. It really did. It became a joke. The, the, those folks who were, who were watching from the gallery running the show thought that I was standing there and mimicking the signs, and this was the only communication underway. Um, they perceived on the day that the, that the approach the, the, the close approach that he made, the, the, uh, the grabbing incident that he, yeah. uh, that he did with me, um, he, they perceived that there was a communication that occurred. So I began getting questioned quite extensively whether or not he in fact was communicating with me because he had promised not to apparently with the Sigma unit. Um, and uh, I alluded to the fact that there was conversation underway, but I didn't talk about what it was until of course the um, I was caught in my research protocol forwarding ideas that were somewhat different than what they expected, where they expected my, re my private research was going to go, and this is much later. And at that time, the, the deal was brokered to find out about the doctrine for the convergent timeline paradox. I told them a little bit about what he showed me, a little bit, and they told me a little bit about the DCTP. Um. Now that you brought that up, which implies travel through time and yes. space, and you said that J. Rod was retrieved from a crash near Kingman. Um, was he at that time just traveling through space from the staging area, or yes? No? Yeah, okay. Yes. He wasn't doing any time traveling at that point. No, not as far as I'm aware. Okay. Not as far as he told me, no. Can you describe J. Rod to us, what he looked like and how he behaved? Yes. The, um, the, the gentleman uh, with which I was uh, associated was approximately three and a half feet tall. Uh, he had a dark brown appearance, very ruddy appearance to his skin. He was in a highly pressurized clean sphere. Uh, he exuded glycoprotein-like material through pores on his skin, um, which was associated with the, the neuritis, the neuropathy that we were, uh, with which we were dealing. Did this have an odor to it? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I couldn't perceive any odors whatsoever. I was inside my... But um, I would imagine, I would imagine, uh, you know, but I have no data set to say what it would have smelled like. And in fact, there was nothing I read 
that uh, um, indicated whether or not there was an odor. Why? I'm wondering. I'm wondering. You've asked that before. That's why I'm wondering. Well, yeah, I've heard about this um, the secretion coming through the pores of the skin before, mm -hmm. and uh, there have been those who've had encounters who say they could smell an odor. Okay. From the skin. All right. Um, where were we? You were describing. Oh. Um, three and a half feet, large head in comparison to torso. Um, so the ratio of uh, the cranial to the torso area would be larger than in uh, what we would call a modern human being. Um, large, bulbous black eyes. The, the whites of the eyes had uh, been selected out. Uh, so it looked like a large pupil, basically. When you look into his eyes, you feel like you're going to fall into his eyes forever. And I think that probably had something to do with the telepathic nature of his, of his mental structure. Um, large arms, uh, length, large length. Um, four very thin, sinuous fingers, uh, nails. Not as long as presented in some of the images that you've showed me in the past. Um, the ones done by Tom Mack, was it? By um, Tom? Bill Hughes. Oh, yeah, that's it, the puppet master. Uh, um, uh, photos. I'm smiling because the puppet master leads me to other nicknames. But uh, um, he was hunched over most of the time, could not support himself fully uh, given muscular atrophy. And that had to do with the, the, uh, the peripheral neuropathy under which he was suffering. Um, so he would grunt and move toward me almost in a flopping fashion. Uh, feet were, were large in comparison to what we would, uh, you know, say our feet would be. Um, he was unclothed four. four. Yeah, he was, uh, he was uh, unclothed, mm -hmm. um, which bothered him. Um, he wanted to wear clothing and uh, was refused in every turn. Um, Called himself, called himself captive, and uh, justifiably so. Um, his uh, feet were unusual in that uh, his his uh, the, the plantar area uh, had a, a very large knob underneath what we would call our heel. Um, his uh, his facial features were grotesque in comparison to what he showed me what normal would be. Uh, he was um, normal of his type. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, his uh, his um, he was bilaterally symmetrical to the extent that uh, uh, the disease process was not changing his facial figures, his features. Um, uh, nose was recessed, not a nose like we have, but basically two two opercula, two orifices. Um, an extremely small. Uh, mouth, um, a hard palate, no teeth. Um, his musculature again; it was it was suffering from the from the the, the, the problem at the, the the myoneural junction, due to the neuropathy. Do you have any idea what his chronological age was? Uh, Six hundred twenty-two. Uh, and and that is a that is a that I don't know. Okay. That I don't know. Um, that number 622 is now used as a an important number within the community, a, 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 a reference, a request from 622 or a report from 622 could be from anybody. Hmm. Um, so it's it's used. And in fact, the the SR, SRB report uh, that I have with me today, the, the supplemental report for 0302 um, that I have. Um, Probably is labeled from reviewer 622. I haven't again again. It's going to be a cold reading when we look at it, but it's probably from 622. Um, they excrete in a manner that we would excrete. Uh, their external genitalia are different than ours. The 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 females have somewhat like vulva, but they have a clasper situation. Um, the male has a male clasper, the female female claspers, and if um, it looks like a disc with rectangular solids that are rotated into position, 
for clasping at the uh, inguinal region. Uh, they do have internal fertilization. Now, this was something you read because you didn't see the female. Did you? No, this is something he showed me of his wife. Oh, internally. Yes. And how was that image presented to you? Did it appear? Uh, I was inside the image. You were inside the image. That's what it felt like. Like virtual reality. It, yes, everything everything that he showed me when he this was this was the the incident. Um, when he projected it into me, it 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 felt like I was there. Mm -hmm. um, my sensations were 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 heightened. Quite extraordinary. Was there a background perceived? Uh, was she in a domicile of some sort? Uh, a, a, again, excuse the pun, a gray surrounding, very, very dull, drab surrounding, almost like a, um, uh, a concrete evacuation uh, center where you'd have evacuation zones uh, underneath the hotels in case of uh, a mass, mass casualties or a mass disaster. Uh, where there, it's a very, it was a very clinical environment. Huh. So, were you impressed that he was kind of depressed about his situation? He was extremely depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, if if we were to term him human, I would. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I think he would be termed as clinically depressed. Okay. He wept, but he didn't weep outside. He wept when he was with me. Well, how, could you estimate what his level of intellect? Smarter than me. He was smarter than me by by a long range. Did he have a wide range of knowledge? Um, the mathematics that he showed me um, blew my mind. Was that right? Um, it uh, he he showed me um, concurrently not only not only the the um, the equations for the rule of nines. But he also did so diagrammatically, and he did so with three-dimensional, like a VRML system, uh, where I was watching cubes come together. Um, so that if I was not understanding, apparently if I was not understanding the script, I would understand it as a child learns groups, group theory in mathematics. Um, a highly evolved. Uh, highly intellectual, um, highly repressed emotionally. When when I was with him, uh, I felt great happiness to be with him, but I could feel his great sadness, not only because of what he wanted to become, what he knew he was by being present with us, but what where he was and how he was being treated. Um, he was not part of the group that has to be catered to involving the, the, the T9 treaty that was just signed. Uh, he wanted to help. He was willing. When I went in, for God's sakes, to, to, uh, I took well over, uh, well, nearly 300 uh, individualized aspiration samples from, from his neurological system, he would hold his arm out for me to take him. There was no pain medication. And whenever I would fire the, the, the um, introduction system to remove the sample, take the, it was an aspirative avulsion system, uh, he would cry. And then he would just stand there and look at me. There was a suction. Yes. Yeah, in fact, it, I, I, would, I would bring the, I would bring the, um, the, uh, um, sample after the the initial initial removal from his from his tissues into the into the introduction system and then approve it and move it from there to one of the helper biologists usually it was uh, it was Robert um, outside of the clean sphere and then he would move it from there to be handled under under our normal protocols it was a, a level five past our you know the BMBL system um, he just stand there and take it. So, do you feel the communication that he established with you when you were 
in contact with him. Could he extend this communication over any distance? 60 feet. 60 feet. Definitely 60 feet. Okay. Because so it was 60 feet from the center of the clean sphere to the introduction ramp going down into the ambassadorial suite. So at least 60 feet. So you don't feel like he's been in communication with you since that time? No. selective in some way? Was it um, willfully selective on his part who he wanted to communicate? Yes. Yes. Uh, the folks that, the folks that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the folks, the, the, the folks that wanted to uh, um, find out what he was saying to me, um, they knew darn well that he was communicating with me after a while because I was smiling. I couldn't help it because we were actually joking back and forth. Um, and, you know, they didn't know. They didn't have any clue. They didn't have any clue what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So it had to have been selective. They certainly wouldn't have pressed me like they did um, after I woke up from the, the big attention scenario. Um, I woke up outside of the clean sphere. I was drug out of there by Stephen. Um, he finally got a secondary suit on and, uh, and drug me out of the clean sphere. Um, no, they had no clue. They had no clue what he was saying. I'm sure of it. They, they, they were they were extra rough in removing my plug and my uh, my catheter and all of that business after I got out of the TES. Now, one of the things that I want to ask you now, parting slightly from this subject, um, we're going to ask this last question. Then we're going to take a break, okay? And then we'll see where we go from there. But. I'm smiling. I'm smiling because I'm envisioning the lack of the lights. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but everybody's yeah, I don't like this at all. Why, and of course you're going to have to restate this again, why are you talking to us now? What is your intention in telling us about this, about your involvement? It's multifocal. Okay. It's, 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 it's multifocal. There's, there's several reasons. Um, the largest reason is not the most important reason. The largest reason from a personal perspective is to step out from under the black ops community and retire. I'm ready. Um, I told you before, I can see myself walking along a pond and not being bothered by anybody except for maybe a, a bird here or there and taking a sample and just taking my time and looking at it for, for fun. For enjoyment. And you're worried about um, your health, right? Well, my health is my health is degrading. There's no doubt about that. Um, the heart disease that I have is, in fact, degrading my health. Um, time is coming. I don't know. I don't know how long that is, and of course, that's within God's providence. So you'd like I, to uh, maybe take uh, have some freedom to have some time yes. of your own yes. to go to Walden's Pond or something, right? And study the life. <laughs> Disappear at Walden's Pond. Right. Um, there are other reasons too. You know, without without yelling the poor me scenario. Um, yes, people have a right to know. I mean, that's you know, other folks um, uh, have have screamed that. Some of them, I think, real. Some of them, phony as a three dollar bill. Um, yes, they have a right to know what is going on. They have a right to know because this is their future. Or maybe not. And it depends upon our wisdom or lack thereof. Um, th th this gets me thinking. The, the, the one thing that, we, that we've heard from the Brookings Institution study, the famous clamp study, um, was, was this would cause a great uh, social upheaval. It would destroy our social bonds, our religious bonds. And in fact, when, I know I'm digressing, but I, I ramble. Uh, the, every time uh, an individual is approached with the issue of would this destroy your faith, I have heard, it's my experience only, I'm sure there are going to be varied opinions. No, it would do, no, it would strengthen it. 
it would strengthen it. From a certain perspective, yes. From another perspective, no. The Brookings Institution was correct on a certain level. Suspend disbelief for a moment and, and walk with the idea that this is real. That the, the ruins that are present on the moon and on Mars, the ancient temples, were in fact, and are in fact, the gifts of our own progeny. Can you imagine what is going to happen when those temples, which were prayed to as the gods, are found out to be nothing more than the creations of men, that the men themselves were those who were being worshipped? will fall headlong into the pool of Narcissus. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we'll find truth, um, love, God, and something other than buildings and uh, stones and marble. Maybe we'll find out who he really is or she, it, or just us. Can you take a break? Please. Take five minutes, yeah. Okay, take five minutes and talk about what we just talked about. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I missed a little bit about the clean sphere entrance in terms of suiting up. Yourself. You did mention the medical exams, which go right. out after a while. Right. But uh, in the other tape, you talked a little bit more about the, some of the mechanical specifics, just to give a better image of That's fine. what it's like for you to do it. That's fine. Okay. That was the, intro the introduction, the introduction gantry, the the, um, the swinging hose. The swinging hose. Uh, yes, those things. Yeah. They're just the, all the, visual. And I, I'm interested in adult things. Though, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> one thing at a time. One okay. thing at a time. Um, the other thing is that, that might be pertinent to what you just did, what you just spoke about, was what you were looking at slide-wise um, prior to knowing you, what the unknown origin of the material was, what its origin was. Sure. You know, just what it was you were looking at. All right. Without you want me to get into the, the microbial? Well, maybe just a, just a general statement of what that was, what, All right. what you thought you were looking at. Hmm. Just to give us a little <laughs> No, that's a good one. You know, um, I, you, I had I had no clue, and in fact, they brought in they brought in a who we got on our side, uh, a biochemist to turn our attitudes around. And uh, after about a year, he didn't turn our attitudes around. He finally joined us, um, and finally said, "No, we can't do this without finding out the origin of the tissue." Right. We needed to find out. See, we, we were dealing with it. We were dealing with a situation where where it was in vitro. Uh, yeah, they we, were, have, we might want to go back on camera for this. So that's fine. Okay. okay. Um, and the other thing that I think uh, we we you you made a, a very good statement about why you're doing this. I wonder if there's anything else we can do for you. Anything else you can say that is of value to you that we can record for you, as far as what you hope to how you how you hope to get out. What it is about. I mean, you, you said it's your health. And a number of other things. I'm just, I'm just wanted to put it to you that if there's anything else that comes to mind that you'd like to add in that, in that regard, in terms of, you know, yeah. what is you trying, you're trying to accomplish? Because I know, I I'd like to tell, I would like to tell our elected government what we're doing. Maybe you should say that. You know, I mean, I, under the appropriate circumstances, because there are military applications um, that uh, need to be handled in a very careful manner. For example. Um, uh, for yeah, for example, yeah. I understand. All and right. Those those I issues we're going to be extremely careful about here today because uh, um, they should be taken with great care. And of course, our our object, which I including the, the, the military applications for Lotus. Okay. I know that we're we're somewhat constrained for time today. Well, how much longer do we have? Well, it's only sixteen thirty-seven. How much time do we have? We've got time. Yeah. Okay. I have to be back at nineteen hundred. Nineteen hundred. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Okay. Okay. We have plenty of time. All right. All right. Okay. Good. We know the rush. Well, what I what my what I wanted to do was 
the only other thing I'd say was we're trying to focus on, and you, it's been great so far, it's been very focused, it's very, very central to the J-Rod interaction. Mm -hmm. We felt that was the best way to introduce you to our next stage. Right. Now, we can talk about anything we want, we've got plenty of tape, as long as you can stand on the lights. You know, I, 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 beyond the three things I just mentioned, anything you might want to bring up. Do you think so that thing is order, real? Do you think that thing is real? What's that? That piece of paper you showed me with the letters. I don't know. See, we spoke, we, we spoke about another individual who has a heart condition. Um, I figured that it was a need to know, it was a need to know basis above that. Um, I didn't figure that there was direct. You see, and, and, and the, the rumors coming at me about the potential for public acclamation, um, that would be for him. Um, those those initials to to um, take back as the hero as the hero in this situation because he loves playing the hero. Um, and you show me a piece of paper that says "ordered to remain." Ostensibly, that's what it meant. Ordered to remain in the capacity, uh, which means that there is a greater loop. I've had the, the, the chance to speak with the individual one time, um, and he was, he was funnier than hell. He really was. Um, I heard that there was a, a transcript involving that that got out. In fact, uh, um, um, I was shown one time. Uh, the, first, the first meeting, the one where I bolted, mm -hmm. the one where you scared the hell out of me, not as much as you did today. <laughs> But in a little more relaxed circumstance. I inferred their use, and I've seen this elsewhere, of the word "burn" refers to PPE. Mm -hmm. I inferred the use of the word "clock" refers to the timeline of Mm-hmm. Well, I would buy that. Before we, before we, let's talk a little bit about the things we just discussed. Um, what was it that you thought you were looking at when you were looking at these slides of material of unknown origin? Well, we were, we, were, we, were looking, we were looking at extremely minute microglial cells. We knew that they were eukaryotic. However, they were unusual in the sense that their cytoplasm and their internal organization, uh, the organelle structures were fused, um, um, such, as, such as dictyosomes to mitochondria things like that. And uh, we, we had no, no idea what we were looking at. The, the original contention um, made by the individuals next to me was that we were looking at uh, some type of biological warfare material, uh, an intermediate. And they had more experience. They have more experience uh, than me involving such matters. So, and being that I was new, I was letting them take the lead. That's great. Now, let's talk a little bit. The, the second one was, um, tell us a little bit more in detail about the physical aspects of preparing for an entry into the atmosphere. Fine. Well, we would undergo a medical examination, at least during the, the, the early time frame uh, of the introductions, the 92 time frame, um, 91 to 92 when we were doing introductions. We had regular systematic uh, medicals by a physician. Um, following that, we would be suited, well, we would be catheterized, plugged, uh, and suited. Um, communication apparatus was placed on our heads. Um, we had a cooling system set up. It was, for all uh, intents and purposes, it was a space suit. It was a total encapsulated suit, something like what you would find uh, in a NASA facility. Not so much uh, something that uh, you would see, well, for instance, at uh, USAMRID or CDC, uh, that type of level four suit. It was more of a regular space type suit with joints. Uh, we were suited up, we were pressurized, uh, and then walked with our cooling system and our hosing down a ramp into the ambassadorial suite. 
Um, following that, we were led up a gantry way, which had been moved into position uh, by the clean sphere, which had been previously rotated up through an iris through the floor. Uh, he was held actually below the ambassadorial suite level, and that was raised up uh, as needed. What they did with him down there, he didn't say, and they didn't tell me. It was not a need to know issue. Apparently, they dealt with the cleaning of the, of the sphere and all of that down there, the regular housed animal maintenance as they treated him. Um, we would be led up the gantry way. The hoses would be hooked into uh, an exterior, um, uh, interior, I'm sorry, system uh, inside the doorway, uh, which was exterior to the clean sphere. Um, and it was called the exterior system, in fact. But and we would be led in, uh, the door would be closed, and we would be pressurized inside of the, inside of the gantry way. Uh, following that, there was a drum system that was set up. Uh, once there was a, an equal pressurization between the gantry way and the clean sphere, we would then be told to proceed forward. Uh, I would raise a hand uh, in, in acknowledgement. Uh, we were not supposed to talk at the time at all because uh, um, nothing verbal around the, the specimen, around the J-Rod. Um, why, I was never told. But we were not supposed to talk around the J-Rod. Um, I moved the drum system and re-hooked a secondary set of hosing inside the clean sphere, um, checked the pressurization, and once that was done, the door to the clean sphere would be closed behind me, and I would presume that the pressurization remained the same in the, the gantry way. Uh, following that, I would do my business inside of the clean sphere involving contacting the J-Rod and removing the samples. And what was the reason you were removing samples? We were removing samples to attempt a treatment, uh, a full diagnosis and a treatment for a paraprotein-related monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance type disorder, um, which had uh, various attributes to it, among which were, were a cocaine-type presence to the, to the J-Rod, cocaine syndrome-type presence, um, and um, certain genetic um, um, issues involving chromosome 5 and 17, which led us to Charcot-Marie tooth disorder um, and um, their, their glycoprotein, their antifreeze glycoprotein uh, um, problems. They were essentially, essentially, they were losing heat because of the problems at their, their axolemal ridges. Um, they were not transmitting the energy, something like a, a uh, dystrophy. Um, and when the action potential goes down a, um, a nerve, well, their action potentials were dying at the, at the synapse. Oh. Uh, they were also losing energy because there was a demyelination process underway. Mm -hmm. That demyelination process was, uh, well, since the Q94 document, uh, was tied to, tied to a um, CMT1A-like uh, problem, the Charcot-Marie tooth uh, problem called uh, PMP22, which is a, a um, protein number 22, which uh, an overexpression of that gene causes a, a, um, a, a greater demyelination. Um, we tied that to the, to the demyelination issue um, uh, involving the promoters for the, the PMP22. Uh, those promoters, there's two promoters for it, um, were selectively deselected uh, with the use of TFOs or triplets forming oligonucleotides. It's essentially a, uh, uh, an SSDNA uh, um, vector expression system that we're using. Can you, can you Oops. That, uh, You're staring at me, Bill. I'm sorry. Where? <laughs> Bill, one thing. One thing. When, yeah. when, when, you're, when you're speaking, when you don't sort of make any noises, it's just not that's good. When I'm not. Sometimes you're going, ooh, R, E. That's a... Okay. Keep just nodding. Great. That's all he's been doing is nodding. I shouldn't. So do you want to simplify? I'm sorry, Bill. No, I don't. Actually, no. I think that's fine. I'm sorry, Bill. Uh, actually, I understood some of it. I'm sorry. Um, um, doesn't that uh, interfere in the demyelination process? Okay, isn't that similar to conditions that humans sometimes have, like, what is it, muscular dystrophy? Well, the, 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 yeah, except for he wasn't forming plaques. Okay. He wasn't forming plaques. He was simply demyelinating. Uh, repairing the demyelination area with the, the immune system. Uh, they've got a, a, uh, um, a cell-mediated immune system, humoral system, just like we have. 
Uh, the the cells are different. They, they've got they've got philopodia, but uh, very very strange looking uh, blood like uh, uh, material. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's like it. But that's why we use the term analog so much because it was different. It was different. Can we talk a little bit about um, some general generalities around the building in which you worked? The sort of you know how many floors it was, and where it was located, sure. how, how you got there. You you want an experience of site four? Watch the Andromeda strain. <laughs> Except for there's a little more color inside of site four. Uh, they've got a nice orange stripe on the wall. And they've got a red and blue stripe on the floor, which gives you general directions depending upon the, the, uh, the floor you're on. And you can't move without getting stopped anyway. Um, the, now, we're, we're talking separate to the groom facility here. Um, I'm aware of several floors at the groom facility. And then finally, the majority of the hot stuff was taken over to site four. Um, we're talking four basic levels. Uh, the first level, and they're, they're coded 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, and then finally where he was stored is 4, 5. And, and that 4, 5 designation was painted on the wall for him because 4 and 5 is 9. Right. That's why, in fact, they built nine hangars mm -hmm. on the, the Galileo and sidekick levels, mm -hmm. uh, the 4, 1 level. The 4, 2 level contained, contained uh, the looking glass, Alice's glass. Um, in fact, outside of the door for the major facility, there's a white rabbit with a clock. A very large, it's a, it's a statue that's probably about that tall, and uh, it's held above the doorway. It's wired above the doorway. Um, the looking glass, I, I find out, is one of the ERBs. It's an Einstein Rosenbridge promoter. Uh, it uses some form of, this is found out, Jesus Christ, uh, in the last two weeks? I'm asking the right questions there, I guess. Um, it's, it's composed of a spherical, spinning, arced, rectangular, solid matrix of nickel, cadmium, and barium. Uh, there is a spinning disk underneath it, which is supercooled. Uh, into this is injected into the center of these, these spinning, and I'm not a physicist. Um, spinning disks um, is injected a, an argon uh, gas. Um, into that is injected some type of repulsion matter. It's a gravity repulsion matter. Um, they are obtaining the gravity repulsion matter from the heavy materials that have been obtained from the J-Rods, the 115 variety material. Um, and Apparently, when they bombard it with enough electromagnetism, this stuff repels gravity, and it turns into some sort of exotic matter. Hmm. Uh, they spin it fast enough, it opens, or they can see through it. Um, and that is, from what I understand, the, the great prize in what's going on in the world right now, are those devices. Um, why do you think the British are running around Iraq right now looking for the climatological records that are just happen to be disappeared out of the uh, the uh, Baghdad Museum with the rest of the cylinder seals. And you're going to see some cylinder seals today, too, when I show you some report. So, Dan, does that mean uh, when they're using, when they're engaging this device in the project looking glass? Yes. Uh, is this something that they use? only for the transmission of information, or can they transport a material object through time? You know the answer to that. Uh, at least you probably heard some, some rumor. Um, there have been mistakes. There were mistakes. Um, uh, animals. Were, were attempted to transport from one location to another, the production of two of the devices, and they put them in resonance or something like that. I, I'm not a physicist. I don't know. Um, but uh, I was, in fact, present during a human attempt. Uh, the human did not survive. The human was not put in there under, under duress of any sort. It was a volunteer situation. 
and the human did not survive. Uh, the human did not move. The human stayed where the human was put. But the human um, changed and uh, I don't want to talk about it anymore. This was an attempt at time travel? It was an attempt at, at well, in essence, yes, it was a linear. Um, it was a it was a uh, attempt to transport a, an individual over linear distance, which I understand is the same thing as time travel. If we're if we're talking purely from the Einstein, translating time space. Well, distance is time. Like a transporter. Yeah, um, from what I understand, they've only used it for for uh, information purposes. Aside from that. How they get the information out of it, no clue. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What specific information they've obtained, um, I only know of one piece of information. And that is the rush, why the rush is underway to get Lotus done by the 2005 deadline. That in fact this, this um, group of J-Rods that are not complying with the, the wishes of the committee and the wishes of the, the rest of the J-Rods and the associated brothers um, to put a clamp on them so that they stop their influence within the political structures of our government, including the financial structures. Um, that it is, in fact, their slowing down of the progress to stop getting in stopping getting these, uh, picking up these little gates that were put together, that would be our downfall in 2012. Okay. Um, do you want to say anything further about the Stargates? Or their use in 2012? Well, before we, before we go Bill, there, we're going to finish up our third objective. What can one do for me? Yes, exactly. Um, I would be very happy, very happy and very relieved to feel as though I was responding to the elected government of the United States of America with what talents God's given me. I'm responsible to the people of the United States of America. The nature of the information to which I'm privy is sensitive enough that the full disclosure of that information would have to be done in an appropriate location and under appropriate circumstances. Certain military application information would have to be done um, in a closed session milieu for the national security. Um, as I said to you at the Luxor, the Congress knows it's not in control. They know that this is a train, a wild train out of control. And they want that control back. They're not stupid. They know that there are things that are going on down the hall from them that they can't fathom. They deserve to have that back in their hands because that's what they were elected to do. And if we care at all about what's left of our Constitution, they deserve to have that in their hands. Aren't we the masters of our destiny in our country? Aren't we supposed to be? Yes, sir. Supposed to be. I hate these lights, but I'm fine. I expect no, that's fine. I, I expect that the, the, the largest light I would have would be a CRT. <laughs> yeah, I was comfortable with that too. Um, I thought it was an insect. 
That's fine. <laughs> Wellington, I went to Dover Grammar School for boys. On the hill over Dover. Four years. Yeah, uh, indeed. <laughs> indeed. We were right above Dover College, and they had all the girls down at Dover College. Right. It's a different boys' school, I take it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wellington. We were not allowed to communicate with the females in the village. We had <laughs> grand, grand master, headmaster Coleman. Oh, right. we, got, we called him the master, actually. Yes. Headmaster didn't want to call him anything else. He had a cane. I ran away. <laughs> Good man. Yeah, really. Had enough of that rubbish. Okay, so so it's back to that question. Let me just rephrase it for you. Can you describe in detail the first time what it was like to meet this being for the first time? My original feeling was I was looking at a giant insect. It's the best I can I can you know you know just you know off the cuff. It, it looked like a giant insect, um, being dark brown, and hunched in a corner, uh, very insectoid in appearance. It almost looked like it had an exoskeleton. Um, I felt afraid inside because I was always told that monsters weren't real. And now I find out they are, but they live in the heart of men. Um, it was fear, excitement, um, complete astonishment. Because honest, honestly, I thought we were dealing with some sort of uh, monkey, um, you know, something like an old world ape or, uh, or the like. But um, indeed, it wasn't. That's what my feeling was. This, you know, I'm not going to lay on and talk about how, how uh, uh, intellectual I was at the time uh, about it. Uh, um, what, what scared the hell out of me. What in terms of actually when you first confronted with the idea that it was you know, a non-human being, an extraterrestrial, something not of this world? Uh... I'm trying to remember um, what I was feeling when I was looking at the briefing books. Because even when we were first introduced to the J-Rod, um, they were him hauling around as to its origin, his origin. Um, poppycock. I didn't, I didn't believe it initially. I didn't believe it. Uh, however, um, you know, deep inside, I held open the possibility, because of what happened to me earlier in my life, um, I held open the possibility uh, that such things could be true. Um, but wouldn't happen to me, put it to you that way. It's that old, that old you know, can't happen to you uh, feeling. So I, to me it was poppycock, it was rubbish, until I found out otherwise. Before going on to the next question, will you talk a little bit about the briefing books? Uh, sure, they were they were called uh, uh, King Tuts, uh, and and they were basically king. They were they were all labeled with K's. The ones that I was allowed, uh, they were they were blue binders. They were all labeled with K's. They had DTIC on the on the front of them, and I still don't know what DTIC. This is 1987, end of 87, and I still don't know what the letters mean. I'm not. Uh, I haven't done independent searches. Uh, on the net, or I would be. Uh, so if you can tell me, what does DTIC mean? Hey, it's a shot for me to find. Uh, you don't know either. Uh, uh, they had a, a white DTIC printed on the front of them. Um, they were marked with several sections, uh, including physiology, uh, general biology, social structure, political structure um, of the J-Rods, uh, their origins, uh, potential implications for interactions with humankind, um, uh, cross-contamination issues. Um, they were full of as much information that I could take in during the times that they were allowing me to read them. Um, but I still don't know what that damn DIT or DTIC means. Um, yeah, they were called King Tuts. They were, they were, they were update books. Uh, the one person. This is this is another reason why I didn't figure that, you know, how how Stephen 
uh, how I could be promoted to a working group leader uh, above Stephen. Of course, I found out and I told you why. Right. Um, at the time, because he kept the updates. He made sure that all of the King Tuts were, were updated. Um, he did the, the, the briefing films that are, that are still resident at Site 4, or at least uh, the last visit. Um, so, you know, I, I, it, the man of that importance, I, could, I couldn't figure out why. Um, but again, that's moot. Sure. Um, Close-knit, very well-ordered society, uh, one which is numerologically based, uh, one which speaks to others that were called brothers, that I now find out are those who left on a spiritual path to another location, to the famed Duat uh, of uh, Orion, uh, the Epsilon Orionis area. Um, Head-to-toe physiology, uh, including including real autopsy photographs, not the Santilli kind, <laughs> but the real autopsy photographs. Um, I mean, uh, he can't sue me for that. I hope he won't raise his head. Probably, but uh, that was disgusting. Um, the the Brookings uh, Institution. Brookings Institute uh, uh, paper was present, as well as several position papers um, clarifying the Brookings Institute. Um, however, each of these that I was allowed into, they had they had separate folders and they had separate clips within them, inside the, th the three ring binders, and I was told which numbers I was allowed to open up, and uh, they were given to me on a card, and those are the ones that I was allowed to review during the times that I was allowed to review them. Um, most of the stuff, I mean, they had everything from military applications, uh, the physics of the craft, and I couldn't have cared less. I was more interested in taking in the biology issues. Um, just doesn't interest me. Aside from the fact, uh, from the, the, uh, the biophysiological interface between the, uh, the, uh, the hand, mind, and uh, the craft, because uh, they have on their hands a number of uh, pads and um, there are open nerves, which are protected by, by various glycoproteins. And those glycoproteins are selectively pushed forward or sucked back via capillary action, uh, or they can be, through an active fashion, pulled back. And it kind of pulls a, a viscous sheath back and allows the, the J-rod to have direct interface with the craft. Um, that, that interested me. Uh, although most of it at the time, and still some of it now, I have no understanding of. Um, a lot of it has to do with, uh, with um, uh, electronics that I don't pretend to understand. Um, I, I was most interested in looking at uh, uh, issues involving their histology, histopathology issues, uh, including some, some uh, autopsy photographs that showed disease processes which were naturally occurring within them. Uh, isolations of, uh, of uh, viral material uh, to include the protocols for new protocols which were, be written, which were being written as they're, as they're working, which is what we're doing, which is really what we're doing. We're, we're writing new protocols, new procedures as we're working forward. I mean, all of the old standbys are there, everything from electrophoresis to, you know, you know what, to anything, but um, we're writing new protocols as we're going because this is not new territory, this is Pardon upon alien territory. How many beings have we had to work with? Um, I only met one. Uh, I am aware of possibly three from from the reading. And at that time, again, I was so I was so stunned by what I was doing. A lot of it was getting by me. Um, when I read the word extraterrestrial, I tunnel visioned. And when I finally believed and understood that it was, in fact, an extraterrestrial, um, none. None. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, 
just want to ask you a question about um, the telepathic communication and nature of it. What is it actually like to communicate with one of these beings telepathically? I mean, what do, you, do you hear something in your head? Do you hear images, see images? Or? I could hear my voice. No, you can hear yourself think. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Habit, looking at the people that are. <laughs> Um, I could, I could, I could hear my voice. However, the cadence, the affect, was something that distinguished it other than me. It was no great, great booming voice from the heavens or anything like that. And I'm glad I do not have a proclivity to hear voices in my head, uh, and have heard none since. But uh, people could probably challenge that. But. Um, I could tell that it was somebody other than me, and I could tell because I felt drawn toward the subject that was sending the communication. Uh, when the J-Rod spoke with me, prior to the bombardment of the images, um, it was something that was part of me, but not part of me. I actually felt non-resident for a moment. It was almost an OBE type feeling. And then I could feel myself pull back and experience the sound. It was, it was physical. It was more real than, than touching an object. Um, and that's the only real time that I felt anything, you know, more physical than physical. Um, is there a sort of convenience of emotion during these communications? 100% emotion. If he was upset, I could feel his pain. Um, it was. It got to the point. It got to the point where, as I was doing the the um, um, needle introductions, I could feel what he was feeling. So as I would inject the needle uh, under the integument and find my proper location prior to, to removing the sample, I could feel the needle entering him. Um, so I could feel his feelings. Were you aware of Bob Lazar or anything when you were there? I saw a guy out on the Mac outside of the Galileo, the 401 area. He was barefoot. And he was just standing, staring off in the distance. This is as we were coming in on the helo. And uh, they keep you within a, a very confined walking area. This is before they started taking the, the buses. We were, we were choppered in. Um, when I saw him subsequent to that, when he did the uh, famous nap uh, videos, Could have been. It could have been. And this was early on. This was. This was. This was. I, I can't prove it. Okay, and I can't. I could not positively identify um, that being Bob. I am aware. I am aware um, of his name being mentioned up there, and it was associated with the term bottle washer, which means an engineer but not a working group leader or anything of the kind. Uh, they, would have, they would have said a, a, a dur or a, a, you know, for director or, or uh, a geek. I was called a geek. But um, um, his name was mentioned. The name was, I heard the name Lazar. I didn't hear Bob. I heard Lazar, and it was not Laser. It was definitely Lazar that I heard. Uh, but I never had... Uh, interaction with him or, in fact, anyone else from uh, Galileo, Sidekick, or Avionics. Um, how successful were you in uh, assisting this being medically? Tempor temporary assistance, temporary relief of pain, uh, temporary meaning, meaning weeks, temporary adjustment of um, uh, muscle tone, and then flat out nothing. He got worse. 
uh, the exacerbation it got out of control again on him. Um, since then, there, there have been, and I'm not certain if he's resident there or not now, um, there has been a um, progress, we'll just say progress, uh, involving what I was yammering on earlier about, about the, uh, the uh, charcot marie tooth disease, the CMT1A. Um, their DNA is triplets. And it's not triplets in the way that you would think of, of a, a number three helix wrapping around the, the major groove between the, the one and two Watson Cricks, well, the, the duplex DNA. Um, their DNA is triplets to the extent that there are, there are what we nicknamed hangers. Um, they look like they're rosettes. The DNAs look uh, like rosettes. They're, they're, they're triplets and then they're braided. Um, it's, it's a super coiled DNA situation. Um, and we had difficulty um, even, even, doing, even doing, you know, anything, let alone anything like a, a single step uh, markers or anything like that. We had difficulty even, even um, um, sequencing the DNA. Um, our long interspersed elements are genes which have been shut off um, that when combined with the appropriate Hoogstein base pair milieu produce a different being what we were before they made a mistake, a grave mistake. They're from here. Oh. Yeah, you can, as you mentioned, this exchange, there's an exchange. Okay. There's been exchanges going on for, for since 19, uh, well, they spoke with us in 41. What's the nature of this exchange? Um, they wish to find a resolution to the broken resonance between they and the other half of they, the so-called Orions and the Reticulans. Uh, they also wish to, for fear of extinction, have a relief of the paraprotein-related problem. And um, speaking about that just for a moment, we found out that um, some of the disease process under which they're, they're, they're fighting is a PNA. It's a, it's a peptide nucleate acid. I don't know if you're, well... Um, a protein-associated background nucleic acid. And that protein-associated background is a prion, which goes to one of the things that they wanted me to do at sweetness. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Um, but the, the, the exchange process is to, is to solve the problem to prevent what went wrong in 2012. And the rogue, if you will, group of the J-Rods are not cooperating with that. But a deal has been brokered for the T9 Treaty to be held in abeyance until 2005. When that treaty is upped in 2005, once they receive what they've asked for, and they should be receiving a little more, and I've already mentioned some of that material they, that they're not aware of yet, the PNA material and, and some of the things that we can do with the, the illegal nucleotides to possibly help facilitate their problems. But um, once that's upped, they are supposed to come under the auspices of the general agreement between the Committee of the Majority and their respective societies. If so, nothing will get turned on aside from what nature and God is providing us in 2012, and we won't separate. However, they will remain as they are, their future selves as well. They will remain as they are, and we will remain as we are. We can't go back. Um, that's just something that's impossible as far as what they can tell, meaning what the, the looking glass people and, uh, and uh, the people that are overseeing 
the star issue, star flower and the ERBs and all of that, the Einstein Rosen bridges. Can you explain what the fuck you're talking about? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so what? I, I kind of get it because I've been watching the tapes and stuff, but it's so compacted. We just said it's so compacted in your own. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I'm just saying let's stretch it out a little bit. Uh, we might want to begin by being specific. It sounded like you were talking more about what they were going to get in this exchange, and we're kind of curious as to what, what are we going to get in this exchange? Well, we're going, to get, we're going to get not wiped out. Okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve vis-a-vis -vis getting wiped out? The biggest problem is to make sure that the... I'm supposed to look at you. Yeah, I know. Sorry. The, 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 the biggest problem is to make sure that there are no human created ERB machines. 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 Yeah, I mean, you know, it sounds science fiction ish, okay? And, and you know, it's hokey sounding, okay? Um, to make sure that there are none of them in existence which can automatically turn on when the next age begins on December 21st, 2012. We are apparently going to cross over the plane of the galaxy, which there is a dense network of wormholes. There is supposed to be some sort of enlightenment, whether or not that's the, the Christ event, or whether that's a burp on a Sunday morning. I don't know what that's going to be. I'm not enough of a, of a, of a scholar that area to, to figure that out, uh, to, to know. Um, I, I do know that that failure would result in too much energy being directed at our planet from our star. And hence my interest in looking at the pretty pictures above the sun, the groaning of the sun. It's the, the pace in which these unusual forms are being produced is increasing. Are we entering an area as we approach this equatorial plane of the galaxy, okay, are we entering an area where there is a, a greater concentration of dust that can so I've heard. surround the sun? So I've heard. Okay. I have been reading about this and this is similar to a situation that happens with a classification of star called T Tauri stars, uh -huh. where, where there's a lot of dust gathered around, and what happens is that the um, star, the sun in this particular case, uh, increases its radiation in the infrared and the hard X-ray areas and there's greater solar flare activity and in the past evidently if we're to believe the mythologies there was conflagration on our planet mm -hmm. so uh, would we be in danger of a heat and conflagration that would make, that would make sense um, and that that sets well with what I heard yes okay then that is what, what we're in danger of that and as well as, as electromagnetic a large electromagnetic burst from the Sun uh, which will upset our electromagnetic, our, our, our poles. All right. Now, what they're calling ERBs, okay, uh, now called wormholes. We'll talk about the wormholes. You're talking about two different, we're talking about natural. There's a number of natural occurring wormholes. There are a number of nodes on the planet, mm -hmm. from what I'm understanding, um, that naturally are sensitive electromagnetically, I don't know, okay? Mm -hmm. They're naturally sensitive to the space through which we pass. Okay. Um, these nodes activate spontaneously when we pass through them or can be struck with electromagnetism and be temporarily opened. And what happens if we use a machine to open an artificial wormhole? Well, it's, it's two different things. Okay. One, they're trying to put well, they have been putting, in fact, Saddam did put two of them together um, in Iraq, which conformed to the ancient cylinder seals, which are now <clears throat> missing from the uh, library or the uh, museum in Baghdad. Uh, obviously, somebody looted them. 
Um, but uh, they went to Tinian Island, by the way. Don't you know? That's where they went first. After that, I've got no clue. Mm -hmm. But they were they were uh, they were looted by the best. Put it to you this way. Now, ha haven't you been investigating uh, a site where there is a natural indeed Frenchman uh, Mountain. Frenchman Mountain, and your work continues on Frenchman Mountain. Yes, it does. Yes, okay. it does. Um, our remote viewing unit first brought the notion that this could be a wormhole situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, we've employed remote viewers for it. Um, since then, there have been uh, occurrences at the, at the uh, mountain that are far in afield from the research that I would be doing for the Lotus. Uh, this two separate things, just absolutely two separate things. Uh, I, I originally went there with a team to do an endosymbiotic research program. Um, I was trying to, to nail down, you read uh, uh, Lynn Margulis's book about the Acarium right. Mastodon. I was mm -hmm. trying to nail down information about that, and also I had presumed that we were from panspermia. So I was looking for an artifact. I was looking for an artifact that might interact uh, selectively with uh, with uh, um, ourselves and fell into the issue involving the the Ganesh particle etc but the 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 um, well, we, we had a flare that passed across the surface of uh, some algae during a test and we just found out by the way that that, uh, that flare and it's included in the report uh, that flare is associated to the speed that a Ganesh particle passes. So it was a Ganesh particle that was actually overly flaring on us that day. But um, uh, it was on a, a May 31st visit of 2001 to Frenchman's Mountain. Okay. Frenchman's Mountain. Um, if you have access to more reports than I'm aware of, you know, anyway. I don't remember the report number, but. Can you articulate for us a little bit more um, de specific detail about the, the the relationship between future and present for these beings? We're, um, well, we're in a chimera. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Just the basics. What we see, for instance, I mentioned earlier uh, ruins on the moon and, uh, and Mars. Um, and you're aware I was involved in, probably you're aware that I was involved in uh, Inca City research, so called Inca City. Um, that's because the J Rod showed me that as an image but didn't show me that as an image of a dead city, showed me that as the image of a future city, a living, breathing society, uh, post-damage here, post-catastrophe. Um, we are literally looking at things that are present, but according to a linear timeline, haven't been built yet. Now, if that isn't confusing, so you want me to explain what the hell I was talking about? That is not confusing. It, it confuses me. Um, well, you're the best man for the job right now. Tell us. What the point? According to the doctrine of the convergent timeline paradox, the J rods to solve their paraprotein problem, used these ERBs to go back in time, and some of them were worshipped. They were treated as gods, and temples were built for them, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the so-called Nubis Ra, that sort of business that came to my, you know, this is getting science fiction-y because it's, it sounds like Bobby God. But this is what I got in exchange for the information that he gave me, so I'll let them know. Um, literally, there are two or more concurrent timelines that we're living in. Two separate existences. And what that means exactly, you know, that, that's what I read. What that means exactly, I'm not sure intellectually limited in that area. 
I didn't, well, I got to be in philosophy, but I'm intellectually limited in that area. And I don't want to present something that I don't know is fact either. It's, that would be not right. But to solve their problem, they messed around with us even earlier than the fact, or earlier when they uh, had been treated as gods. Um, they went back, treated as gods, went back before. In other words, they can apparently select the timeline. Um, how they do that again, no clue. Uh, they manipulated our original DNA uh, and removed a single strand from us. This made us able to meet with another experiment which was underway at the time called Neanderthalensis. And yes, I know there is no genetic evidence concerning the mating between the Neanderthals and the other brand, if you will, of our kind. That's because all of the genes have been turned off. They all any of the unusual mating sequences aside from, from retroviruses that tagged along were turned off as part of our long intermittent sequences. They're part of the great repeats. And in fact, the Neanderthals, take a look at the number of, of, uh, of uh, long inter interspersing elements that they have in their genome, and that will bear out what I'm saying. I think there's a new article in the new scientific special edition Scientific American by a woman uh, anthropologist who says um, her research shows that um, Homo sapiens uh, did mate with Homo neanderthalus at some time. Okay. So, I mean, whatever research she wrote about seems to bear out what you're saying. Well, it has been believed, it has been believed that uh, um, the crossbreeding mismatched our chemical and our structural architecture um, neurophysiologically and that was one of the yeah, primary promoters for, for the problem that uh, the J-Rods now suffer. That it, it, yes. But I had my security present in case. Right. It wasn't. <laughs> We're kind of wrapping up and we're kind of in the middle of trying to have the opportunity, it's a good opportunity to talk about this time loop. And you were talking about going two different points of going back in the past, one and then one earlier. And what we haven't gotten to yet though is, is sort of a general description of what we're talking about here in, in more in, um, in general terms. What the guys are uh, right. This is ostensibly for the public. It's it's the it's the it's the it's the par it's the paradox of killing your grandfather. It's it's the paradox of killing your grandfather. If if you kill your grandfather, do you cease to exist? Um, Michio Kaku, um, from what I can glean from from his work, uh, would would say no. Would say no. It would cause two separate universes, two separate time streams. But in accordance with, with the doctrine that I read, his theory doesn't take into account that those two time streams could occur simultaneously. That, that the, the, the um, reality could be mixed, which is why there are so many confusing data sets involving everything from fossil finds to, to strata, uh, why there are so many uh, conundrums involving the, the speed of planetary formation. Uh, there was a recent thing out that I, I had read um, uh, about uh, a planet being formed in a very short period of time, um, much shorter than what they had accounted for for the accretion theory. And, 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 the, and the way that it came through uh, to me was, uh, it was a, it was a, a Keystone DCTP 
um, um, flyer, because I'm in on some of the loop, no pun intended, um, that, that these things are happening simultaneously. That a planet can form at one rate and the reality can mix such that we can perceive it having formed at a separate rate. And go, and go back and look at it another time and have another perception because the realities are actually mixed. And they're also now saying that the Earth appears to be older than they thought it was. Mm -hmm. And it's age I have no clue. One would have to ask the Almighty. Mm -hmm. you, you can look at some, are you saying that you can look at something one day and measure it and look at it the next day and the measurements can be different because a different timeline is then Come into play. Yeah. And and biologists, chemists, well, natural philosophers call that error. And if something falls outside of their acceptable range of error, they call it non written because they would call it non publicized and then they wouldn't get their funding. That's the nature of the big business of science. I mean, ask a guy associated with my mentor at SUNY. Uh, his name was Carl, and he had a little problem in Louisiana, we'll say that. Um, he jumped ship, and he wanted to measure uh, some things having to do with uh, free radicals. And this will give you an idea of what happens if you it's the wrong people off, or you don't get enough funding. He had funding 10 days prior to, uh, you know, he had lost his extramural funding, and he had funding 10 days prior to his, his uh, separation. They separated him anyway. If you don't show the progressive upkeep of the funding, you're not there anymore. And it goes much deeper and much, much uh, wider than publish or perish. So again, in terms of clear explanation, what is it we're trying to, in the treaty that we have, what is it we're trying to work with, or they're trying to work with us to? 100% cooperation, 100% cooperation um, in getting rid of the ERBs in exchange for 100% cooperation to solve their physical problem and to attempt their rejoining. And yeah, those are, that's a big word, big, big pool at the end that I just said right there. Um, where that will go, I'm not sure. However, the, the, the project under which I'm working right now may help some. What may help some. It, it's a electrophysiological resonance which is present around, in, and through our DNA, which it is believed by some of the more esoteric people to come uh, via the supernal triad, the divine sephira, the, the tree of life, which holds us together as intellectual and emotional beings. It is that dualism that keeps us in sync with the universe. Say a little bit about your sort of current conditions and where you're working now. Anything like that? Sort of what, what's going on with you at the moment? Well, um, as in as in environmental, my environment. I, I, I uh, am in a in an environment of a. I'm not going to get personal with the issues here. Uh, I'm in an apartment environment. Um, there are children around me which is wonderful. Um, I direct the project from that location. Um, do do some minor microscopy work from there. Nothing of a hazardous nature, any more than dust would be hazardous to you. Um, in times of, of need, I'm transferred to various facilities, um, not worldwide, but nationwide, and work 
within those facilities under whatever the protocols that you know we need to complete. Uh, those facilities are as wide ranging as Delchi. Um, the Shady Rest Site 4, um, the Groom Lake facility, Brookhaven, uh, the Los Alamos area, the T5 section proper, um, and recently in this little event in Alamo Canyon. So I had to show, uh, as well as give testimony, I had to show some evidence when I was there to a mirror. They were sitting on the other side of the mirror, so I hear. As God is my witness, there maybe wasn't anybody on the other side of that damn mirror. <laughs> but uh, they told me they were. Demonstrate. Uh, uh, demonstrate results. Demonstrate data, yes. Show, show data sets relative, Project Lotus, uh, and the three portions of it which are simultaneously underway. So you've been involved in this exclusively for 20 or 15 years? Uh, since 86. Well, I, I I played with local jobs around town. Right. You had um, an environmental company, right? Kane Environmental. Company. Yeah, that's when I was carrying the name Crane. But you're pretty much exclusively engaged in a project which is fundamentally tied to the future of our species. It is. It is. Yeah. Fundamentally, um, this project, without getting too deep into it. I've been accused of rambling by uh, people before about it, but without getting too deep into it, this project is um, an all-encompassing attempt to grab for the brass ring uh, and making sure that that brass ring is not the fruit of the tree of life. I'll grab just until we get to that point, but aside from that, I'm not going to try to barge my way into past the east gate of Eden. The people who do that get hurt, at least so I've heard. And you're bridging what we have traditionally called physics and metaphysics, it sounds like, into one continuum. Because some of the things you're talking about are, are what are tied to what well, indeed. refers to. Indeed. Um, and, and not even just pop metaphysics, but um, the ancient esoteric sciences. Um, For, for millennia, we've, we've conceived of the supernatural and that supernatural's interaction with humankind. Um, what we are seeing in this project is that it's not so much supernatural, it's natural and it's been there with us all along and we just haven't taken the time to look. In fact, our, our procedures have been, have been mutually exclusive Laboratory procedures have been mutually exclusive to find what we found. Um, they would destroy or mask over the process that, that uh, we're, we're now beholding. These particles have the ability, in, in essence, to bend light. Um, and in the report, you'll see a series of, of, uh, of um, images that show clearly where the particle is changing into the shape of a yeast cell, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's masking. The closer it gets to it, the more it masks. So if it passes by it, it looks like it. And then when it gets within close proximity, the, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing steps out and it does its business. Meanwhile, the average investigator, biological investigator, has ceased looking because the protocol has moved on. He or she has scanned a, a slide and has seen two eukaryotic cells and has moved on. I have one last question for you. I don't think we're going to wrap. It gives you time to relax and get that. That means the exact, lights are off. Tell me, that lights off. tell me exactly, exactly in your own mind how you want to get out. How do you want to see it go? Well, first of all, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a deep question because I don't know where this is, how, how this arrangement was made today. Neither do I. So getting out is a loaded term mm -hmm. right now. 
I don't know where it's going to go. But what I do foresee is if that same elected government is interested in the information, I do see myself providing that to my elected government as I've been sworn to do so. Now, whether or not I'm prevented from doing so, we'll find out. Again, we all have to go sometime. But uh, I, I see that as the, as the logical step, because once the information is presented to the elected government, and once I am no longer officially held, and, and it's, not, see, it's not just the information involving the Lotus, there are military applications associated with it as well, biological applications. Once that information is no longer a constraining factor, freedom. Whether or not I'm yelling it on the chopping block, I don't know. Do you know but freedom nonetheless. Do you know who specifically you think you should be talking to? Um, no. No. I, I, would, I, would, I would think that, um, oh God, I wouldn't know which Senate or, or um, congressional committee would need to uh, bring me under their, their authority. I don't know which one. There's got to be one with the right name on it. And once that's done, under the appropriate circumstances, I will tell them everything that I know. Um, so help me God. Maybe we can help you find out who that is. That's right. <clears throat>